for sure. And uh, we thank you all for being here. And I am going to turn the floor over to Little Larry himself. Thank you. Good to see some of you again. Uh, some new faces. Appreciate it. Um, this evening is going to be kind of different. Um, we're going to talk about technology, innovation, and inventors, but not modern technology. We're going to talk about technology in the 1880s. Um, it seems like every generation seems <coughs> to make their own cutting edge of technology. And uh, certainly, uh, it was no different in the 1880s. When the prospectors first came here in 1879, uh, granted, they came with uh, a few burrows and pick and shovel. But they were well aware of the fact that the reason they were here was because technology had changed so rapidly in the mining industry uh, during the 1860s, 1870s, primarily because of the Comstock load in the Virginia City of Nevada. Um, and, and they knew that they were simply the, the first step in what was going to happen. Uh, they came here in June of 1879. Uh, <clears throat> They probably later that fall read something in the newspaper of a gentleman back east um, by the name of Thomas Edison, who had just invented the incandescent electric light bulb. So that's our timing. Uh, things were changing quite rapidly. And uh, it was, mining had not, it had overcome the simplicity. Mining was now an industrial enterprise. It was going to take a lot of capital, it was going to take a lot of uh, power and innovation and technology to go 4,000 feet deep to pump tons and, uh, gallons and gallons of water uh, to lift tons and tons. So things were changing. The primary uh, mining by then had become quite industrialized. This is a a wonderful sketch advertisement for the Holden Smelting and uh, Milling Company. It was actually the Lex Aviation Works, and that is the Holden Memorial site uh, just across the way, which is now the Aspen Mining and Ranching Museum. And if you've ever been over there, especially when uh, when we're there with a bunch of uh, third graders and mm -hmm. seniors, you understand. But this is this is sort of the height of. Mining in Aspen, and it gives you a good idea of just how industrialized it was. And this is just a refining process. So we have chemicals, we have chemists, we have uh, metallurgists. Uh, it, it's become very involved technologically. And the Holden was a new innovative uh, technology. It was Lex Aviation. It was a form of uh, roasting silver, turning it into a silver chloride, and then finding a way to leach it. Not with cyanide, <laughs> uh, So this is the the main uh, form of power at the time, and this is the stereotype of steam power. Steam started to change everything. No longer, you no longer needed to have a factory on a large river with a water wheel. All you needed was a small water supply, a smaller boiler an engine, you didn't need the tracks, and you could take that steam boiler, that steam engine, and you could run a sawmill. You could plow a farm field. You could run machinery, massive amounts of machinery. You could hoist tons and tons of ore out of deep pockets inside the mouth. So steam revolutionizes everything, uh, and it is incredibly useful. You can get a steam boiler this high. You can bring a steam boiler in uh, and have a very small engine and perform a uh, marvelous amount of work with it. So steam technology, it actually started in the early 1880s. Uh, James Watt, uh, fellow Scotsman, um, from um, just outside of Falkirk, just on the east side of Falkirk, uh, between Edinburgh and Falkirk. Uh, where's, where's that located? What's that hill behind? What is this hill? Uh, this is probably frying pan. I'm looking at the geology. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably frying pan. 
Oh uh, no, it can't no, be in front. Gina, yeah, Gina. It's got to be down by Glenwood. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be down by Glenwood uh, because you get the, the generation. Um, no, that's uh, it can't be in front. Yeah, that's the wrong railroad. <laughs> 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 but what happens is steam can be portable. This is a little bit later in time. This is about the turn of the century. But you see you've got a steam boiler and you've got a steam tractor. This helps in the farming. In the farming, uh, you can have a PTO power takeoff, a big flopping uh, canvas uh, belt, flapping in the breeze. Uh, hopefully nobody's nearby. And you can thresh uh, tons and tons of uh, grain, etc. Looks like they've got a water wagon over here, which is incredibly important because you have to keep your boiler with a sufficient amount of water. <clears throat> the other application that is very important in Aspen in the early days is instead of this, this comes later, but I didn't get a good photo of a sawmill. The very first steam engine that came into the valley was a small steam engine brought by uh, Andy McFarland. Andy McFarland was a deputy sheriff in Leadville, and he had on the side, he ran a sawmill. Uh, it was a small one. He, did, he heard about Aspen. He knew one of the first things they would need is lumber to build buildings. So he loaded up two wagons and headed to Aspen. He was not the first wagon to Aspen. The first wagon was uh, Mr. Gerard. He brought a wagon over Independence Pass, but it wasn't a road. <laughs> it took him six weeks. He took the wagon apart and brought it piece by piece. <laughs> so, uh, a little different. Uh, but he, he could rent the wagon for $5 a day. So, he was pretty smart. The second wagon, Andy, Andy left Leadville, went to Buena Vista, and went over Cottonwood Pass. And he knew that Mr. Elrod was ahead of him. Mr. Elrod had a wagon full of supplies. And they went over, both went over Cottonwood Pass, and then they came over Taylor Pass. And Andy brought his two wagons down. He got as far as Ashcroft. The people in Ashcroft convinced him that he didn't need to go to Aspen just yet, that they needed him as badly as the people in Aspen. So he spent the first three months with his steam engine in the valley uh, in Ashcroft before he came down here. He eventually set up uh, up Hunter Creek. And by the time he set up, there were three uh, lumber mills, but two of them were run by water. So they had a water mill. One was up to Warren Fork, and another one was up uh, Hunter Creek. But that's the first steam engine that came to San Diego Lumber was critical. We needed lumber. We needed lumber for building houses. We needed lumber for uh, inside the mines. Um, I should point out that this is also quite dangerous. Uh, steam is, is we're, we're really lucky to have steam. It's a great power source. What you're doing is you're taking water and you're increasing it 1,600 times. When you turn water to steam, it expands 1,600 times. So if you can contain that pressure and use that pressure to your advantage, you've got power. But if you contain that and you lose control of it, mm. this boiler explodes. So uh, in the 1890s up in Woody Creek, one of the sawmills, the boiler blew. One gentleman was killed. It was a fatal. They were lucky the other men were further away. Depending on which newspaper you read, uh, parts of the boiler were found either a quarter of a mile away or one mile away. Um, not, not unheard of. A, a, a half a mile is probably more uh, consistent, but that's the amount of power that, that, that you are containing and dealing with. So if you don't keep the water level proper, then you'll turn it to too much pressure. It's like a pressure cooker and it'll pop. So that's a problem with water. Lumber is quite necessary. We need it in the mines. So we are cutting every tree we can find, and it's with steam power. Uh, if you want to see a, uh, a lumber mill, there's one out at the Holden Perold, uh, outside, and it has a saw blade that's about five feet 
in diameter. So pretty dangerous. I wouldn't get there if it was running. Uh, later on, one of our famous uh, owners of the sawmill was Jenny Adair. <laughs> been to Jenny Adair Park down by the post office. That's where Jenny had her lumber. She came here, I think she was 17. They had just married and uh, they started lumbering up in Hunter Creek and uh, her husband was hauling lumber down Smuggler Mountain. Uh, hit a bump, he fell off the wagon and the wagon went over. And so Jenny took over and I, I liked Jenny. She was uh, quite creative. Uh, she stayed here for, oh gosh, I don't remember when she passed away. I think she passed away like on July 4th. I don't remember that date, but I don't remember. But a lot of people remember her. She was, we got some stories. That's another story. <coughs> so, steam is important in the mines. Every one of these smokestacks represents a boiler. And a boiler, the boilers here are at least a minimum of four feet in diameter and 12 to 16 feet long. Now, the problem is that requires a tremendous amount of fuel, an incredible amount of fuel. And by the way, steam power is only 30% efficient. So you're wasting 60% uh, or 70% of your uh, effort is wasted in lost heat, uh, how much it costs you to run it, etc. So hmm. it's it's very powerful, but it's not the most efficient system. This is at the uh, Smuggler Molly. Uh, this is some of the, uh, the mill sites. The lumber mill is in this building. Um, we've got concentrators, and we are running compressors, air compressors, and those air compressors are going to be used for drills. We're going to change from drilling by hand. If you've ever seen us do it, the J, I haven't hit your thumb in quite a while. Uh, but, <laughs> but they did it by hand. They had a hammer and drill, and they just did it by hand, and they drilled holes. By 1862, they had invented drills that operated by compressed air. By the 1880s, Aspen was starting to introduce drills uh, in the late 1880s. Up until about 1887, uh, Aspen was still doing it in my hand. But once the smuggler became such a massive producer, 100 tons a day was nothing to come out of. Sometimes 300 to 500 tons a day were coming out of the smuggler. It had to be processed, it had to be drilled. So that's what these are for. And I've given you enough time. Anybody figured out how many stacks there are? <coughs> There's 16, right, Jay? Yeah. Correct. <laughs> Actually, there are more. There's two. There's another boiler here. There are two more around the corner. And there's another one over <coughs> here that's got three stacks. So we know the smuggler. This is the powerhouse in the smuggler. This is uh, part of the steam power that's coming in here. It's running some some gears which run the hoist. This is the wire rope, and that's going to lower the men down and bring the ore up. Um, quite extensive. We're going to go as deep as uh, 1,800 feet deep in the lines here. But, yeah. And then comes new technology. That light bulb that um, Thomas Edison invented was an incandescent sealed bulb. Prior to that, we had this type of electric lighting. And what you see here is an arc, a brush arc electric light. What happens is we're using DC electricity, plenty of voltage, right amount of amperage, and we have these electrodes. And these electrodes are put at a certain distance apart. If you have enough voltage, a spark will cross. That's light. Mm. And that's called arc lighting. And arc lighting was available as early as the 1880s. Uh, in fact, arc lighting was used in Wabash, Indiana, in 1880 and, uh, for a street lamp. And 
its power was, get this, min generator. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty amazing. Of course, so sophisticated today. Um, the problem with this is there's an electrode down here, there's an anode up here, and the spark starts. So they switch on at, at dusk, they switch on the power, and the spark starts to spark, and it creates the light. And you've got lenses up here that help reflect that light. It's a very, very bright light. As the evening goes on, this is sacrificial. It will begin to wear away. So by dawn, this is either too short and needs to be reset, or it has to be replaced. And that's what this gentleman is doing. Someone has lowered it, he's probably lowered it, the horse is trained, the horse comes over, he sets it here, takes it apart, and he's going to replace these. If you look at some of our old photos in Aspen, they were taken early in the morning, you'll see these still hanging in the intersection, and there's smoke coming out of it. Mm. So that's our first type of electric lighting, hmm. was brush electric lighting. So electricity is pretty phenomenal. It's the new hot technology. And Aspen will introduce hydropower electricity to the community in 1885. Now, uh, at first, we have incandescent lights available. Uh, one light bulb per month is a dollar and a half uh, for a house. Uh, we have street lights, which are arc lights. Um, and we have, uh, they start using some of the power in the mills. Now, if you're a follower of Aspen history, you've probably heard Aspen was the first community in the world, the United States, west of the Mississippi, Colorado, <laughs> west of the Continental Line, whichever one you want, was the first uh, to have public hydropower electricity. I'm not willing to go there, okay? Uh, by 1885, electricity was being developed. This was the new science. And they, everyone wanted it. And everybody was trying it. Uh, there was a hydropower plant in Appleton, Wisconsin already. Uh, hydropower had been experimented with. There was actually a house lit uh, in England uh, by hydropower electricity in 1863, I believe it was. So, uh, hydropower was around. Um, in 1885, the Aspen Electric Company was formed uh, in, I believe, January. In February, Uray's Electric Company was formed. And Uray had a hydropower plant as well. In February of 1885, Ure had passed a law, no, Ure was already stringing the wires from pole to pole. Uh, in February of 1885, Aspen finally passed an ordinance to allow poles to be put in place. Um, <clears throat> what I've done in my research is I've gone back and found publications. Um, the Engineering and Mining Journal about power in mines and communities. Uh, there was actually a power journal printed. Um, General Electric printed um, many pamphlets. And what I find in all of them when they talk about Aspen is they say, Aspen was among the first to use hydropower public electricity. May have been the first. One of the first four but they fail to name who the other three are. Um, so that's what the publication said. What was happening was this was happening all over the country. Who was first? Could have been days, could have been hours difference. It's really hard to say. A lot of times in technology, when someone is doing something here, they're doing it here and here and here and here. It's like computer technology today. Somebody comes out with something new and within minutes everybody else has the same thing. They've been working on The automobile was the same way, the internal combustion engine. It's hard to tell who actually invented the first one because everybody was doing it at the same time. So 
To be on the safe side, yes, Aspen was on the cutting edge, it was on the leading edge, and it was one of the first. In 1885, there were 50 hydroelectric power plants in North America. In 1886, there were 200. So that gives you an idea. It was, it was quadruple in, in, in less than a year. So um, to say we were first, we're very certain we were the first. The first time that I found anything that said Aspen was the first town to have hydropower and electricity, was printed in the um, Engineering Mining Journal of 1919. Mm. It was an article written by Clarence mm. Doolittle. Mm. And Clarence Doolittle, in the first sentence in 1919, said, Aspen, Colorado was the first hydroelectric power plant in the United States. Now, some of you don't know who Clarence Doolittle is. Clarence Doolittle was the electrician and the mining and, and the electrical engineer who put together one of Aspen's first power plants. <laughs> and he's one of our inventors. Uh, Clarence Doolittle invents, I think, I think it might be coming up, let's see here. Well, well, we'll go to that. Well, let's, let's go back. Clarence Doolittle, whoop. Clarence Doolittle invented the Doolittle Governor. And it was used quite extensively in hydropower. What is enclosed in here, you got a pipe coming off of, off of a mountain. In this case, 850 feet high up in Hunter Creek. There's a reservoir. They got a pipe coming down the side of Smuggler Mountain. Comes down. They squeeze it down to a little nozzle. And that nozzle looks like a, a yard nozzle. And it sprays into cups. Well, the problem is this pressure, you would think it would be constant once you get it backed up, but the pressure would change from time to time, and also the power requirements for town would vary as people had more demand. So how do you keep the electrical power at a constant rate? And Mr. Doolittle designed the nozzle to be moved, and it could hit directly and create the maximum power, or it could deflect slightly and only hit the edge of the cups and create a little bit less power. So he's one of our very first inventors, and that's the Doolittle Governor used in hydropower. This is the hydropower plant in Hunter, uh, Hunter Creek Power Plant. This was not constructed until 19, uh, 1890. It's the third power plant. The actual first power plant was May 23rd, 1885. They turned on electricity to some of the street lamps in town to test the system. And it was actually a small dynamo in the smelter down on the Rio Grande property. Uh, they were experimenting there. Then the Castle Creek, they built a tiny plant over at the Castle Creek, and the Castle Creek plant started online. And then the demand was so great, they built the Hunter Creek plant. And it's even more complicated than that because there was a lawsuit. But that's just <laughs> We talked about the lawsuit. Oh, that was last week. Yeah, the lawsuits last week. So that gives you an idea. Um, yeah. Now, in 1886, or 1887, um, Mr. Sprague, who had developed electric motors for streetcars, was quite uh, popular and he had an idea. And the people at the Veteran Tunnel on Aspen Mountain decided that maybe they could lift by electricity instead of steam, lift the ore cars out of the Veteran Tunnel. It was 500 feet down and it was at a 50 degree angle. And they said, Mr. Sprague, if you can figure it out. Well, he modified a streetcar engine and indeed and in this case no one's objecting this was the first use of electricity underground for hoisting. Aspen we do have a first yeah. okay we did get a first and it was uh, here. Um, <clears throat> this uh, little tiny engine ran uh, began in 1887 
and it was running two or three years later, they added another engine. This one ran constantly, no problems at all. And it started to change the mining industry because now, instead of that steam, which was inefficient, expensive, you needed fuel, a lot of problems with trying to run a steam engine at altitude and at timberline where there wasn't any wood or, or a lack of coal. So electricity started to enter into the mining field and in, uh, in the later years of, of Aspen's boom, next to the smuggler and the Molly Gibson mine, the Della S, the Molly Gibson and the smuggler mine got together and they said, why don't we see how far down we can go? And they wanted to go down 1,800 feet. They thought that, that they would hit bedrock or the two faults would come together and that would be a rich pocket of oil. So they came up with the free silver shaft. The free silver shaft uh, was built and operated. Um, one, of the, one of the purposes of it was to help drain the smuggler mine and the molly mine at the 900 level and then they had huge massive pumps. But what's interesting is they decided to run it 100% by electricity. Now that was pretty revolutionary at the time. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, a few hours after they started, the building burned down. Uh, <laughs> well, that, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, there was a shooting. Uh, they rebuilt it, and then in 1914, lightning hit it and burned it to the ground. Yes. However, <clears throat> General Electric said the largest electric hoist in the world, 1895, free silver shaft. So Aspen not only had uh, a mining operation that was 100% electric, but it had the largest electric hoist in the world at the time. Now, about six months later, a uh, place in Idaho put in a bigger dynamo. But um, it just gives you an idea of the massive. This is the motor over here. This is the dynamo right here. You can see the wires coiled. <laughs> must weigh tons. I think it weighed 3,700 pounds, something like that. Um, so. Electricity started to find its way into other methods. We were drilling in the mines using compressed air. Someone said, why not use electricity? And the Sullivan Drilling Company uh, not only decided to use electricity, but they decided to use a diamond core drill. And a diamond core drill is a hollow drill. And what you do is you drill, and then you pull the drill pipe out, shake it out, and it tells you where you're drilling. What are you going to? So you want to send three dozen men for a month to go 50 feet or you can go 28 feet in one hour or one shift in one eight hour shift. So you can now explore in the mine. Where do we go next? Well I think the fault goes this way. Let's see if it does. Drill 100 feet, 200 feet, pull this out, tells you what kind of soil you're in, what kind of ore you're in. The largest nugget, 2,060 pounds pulled out of the smuggler mine, was discovered using a Sullivan number one electric drill. <laughs> By the way, that's courtesy of the Colorado uh, Dead Republic Library. We don't have that photo here. Just an FYI. So thank them for that. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty interesting because uh, it's electric motor, but this is water. They're pumping water in here around it to, to uh, lubricate it and keep the dust down. The <laughs> mining journals in 1888, uh, there was a mining journal said we are using the diamond, 1890, sorry, said we're using the diamond drills in the 
Aspen Mountain, and it's one of the most successful uses of the electric diamond grill. So we're, we, we are, once again, uh, on the cutting edge in mining. By the way, we have streetcars. Did you know we had streetcars? Uh, this is the old streetcar pulled by uh, horses. The electric, uh, the streetcars were electrified. And we had electric streetcars in this one. So we were just like any metropolitan city around the country. But if uh, it was innovative, if it was the latest technology, we were the ones that were going to have it. And so we had electric streetcars. Cost five cents to ride it out to the rural West End. <laughs> it didn't work too well. It fell off the tracks in the wintertime all the time. People found it was easier to ride their horse. And <laughs> We have other inventors. So let's talk about inventors. Um, this gentleman lived in Carbondale, and this is his patent. Hmm. He patented this, this device. He's got potatoes. Uh, after the mining, potatoes became the cash crop um, up and down the valley. Uh, we were world famous for some of our potatoes. Uh, one variety of potatoes was used exclusively in the Pullman dining cars in the railroads. Uh, came out of Carbondale. I can never remember the name of it. The McClure Red. McClure Red, that's exactly right. That's right, yay! Yay! And all the potatoes. That's, that's Captain, Jack. Captain Jack would know that. That's right! <laughs> we have some insiders. She played Captain Jack. I just found lemon drops in my pocket. <laughs> uh, this gentleman invented a way to cut, and it's as simple as could be, but he could cut the seed potatoes and then plant them. And uh, he received, I think his name was Powell, uh, uh, was his name. So he's one of our inventors. Uh, there were inventions uh, that happened inside the mines. This is a complicated uh, a uh, diagram of mining, but at the end there would have been tables here to shake. And the most common table was a Wilfie table. And what they would do is they would crush the ore, add some water, and by the time it got down here, the table set at an angle this way and an angle that way, toward the corner. And it had ripples in it that went longitudinal. As it shook, the light waste rock would bounce off. It was lightweight. But the heavy rock was the mineral. That was the lead, the zinc, and the, and the silver. It would get stuck in the ripples and go down to the corner, concentrate, and they would collect the concentrate. So we had lots of concentrators here. And the Wilfie table was um, one. However, Mr. Hallett, who was mine manager of the smuggler, and the Hyman properties designed a pallet table, which in all of the mining technical books that I've come across says the pallet table, a modification of the Wolfie table. Mm -hmm. uh, so he may have made the, the riffles a slight different. But he also designed a process for treating zinc. And zinc uh, became a problem here uh, until the turn of the century when we uh, had a demand for it. So he developed this system, and this is his patent. He's got the patent number right there. Uh, Mr. Hallett had uh, several patents, but the Hallett table he's best known for. The Hallett table, a modification of the table. And then we come to my favorite inventor. <laughs> this is Mr. David Brunton. David Brunton is characterized. He's in the. He's in many mining. Uh, Books. He's uh, uh, at the Mining uh, Hall of Fame. He's um, he's a mining engineer. He he's raised in Canada. He, by the age of 14, he's already coming up with inventions. He figured out a way to feed his dog outside without the cats getting into the, to the food. Uh, he made a box with a spring on it, and the dog had to hit the hit the pedal, and it opened, and the cats. <laughs> so he was quite inventive, and um, he eventually went to school and learned to be a mining engineer. In the 1880s, mining engineering was quite lucrative. The first few years that the Colorado School of Mines operated, they never had a graduate. 
These students would learn one or two years of school. They would go on summer uh, internship somewhere, and they didn't come back. <laughs> because there was so much demand for them, and even a couple of years of experience was more than anybody else had. Uh, fortunately, Mr. Brunton continued. Eventually, he wound up in Leadville, and he became quite well known in Leadville. He was operating, he was in charge of the Stellar Mine, uh, Seller Mine, uh, which at that point in time, 1886, was the largest producer in Leadville. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Brunton was quite innovative. He knew a lot about the geology as well. And so he was invited by the lawyer in Aspen who was representing the sideliners. He didn't always make the best choice. Uh, in, <laughs> in the Apex sideline lawsuit, okay? Uh, and he was to go to the uh, district court in Denver on the appeal of the Apex sideline in Aspen and talk about geology and how maybe this isn't the right vein, and it got complicated. He testified, and <clears throat> at the end of his testimony, the lawyer said, please come to my office this evening. He figured he'd really screwed up. Um, what happened was he walked in, and the mine owners who had hired him in Aspen were there as well. So he really knew he was in trouble. Um, however, they approached him, and they said, we are so impressed with what you said, whether we win or lose, big time, but um, they were so impressed with his testimony and his knowledge of mining that they wanted to hire him to work in Aspen. Hmm. And he said, well, I've got a great job in Leadville, I've got a house, and I've been traveling around the country doing consulting work, uh, I don't want to leave Leadville. And they said, well, what will it take? And he wrote down a figure, I don't know what it is, he didn't reveal it. But he handed it to them, and they said, uh, you can't get to Aspen soon enough. How fast can you get there? And he came to Aspen, and he arrived in 1886, and he stayed in Aspen, and he worked here. Um, he was pretty practical. Uh, he came up with all kinds of inventions. He, he figured out a way to save money on timbering. That timbering that you saw was square. He invented a machine which simply took the bark off the tree, put it to a, a specific diameter, a lot less expensive to do, invented that, so we had round timbering. Uh, he had, in his lifetime, 60 patents. Wow. And this is my favorite, although this is not what he's famous for. He was eventually hired to oversee the Cohenhoven Tunnel. And the Cohenhoven Tunnel was at the end of Spruce Street, what Mr. Cohenhoven and DRC Brown came up with was, let's build a tunnel underneath Smuggler Mountain in the same uh, vein, the well, vein's the wrong word that he's talking about money, uh, in, in the same concept as uh, the Sutro Tunnel in uh, Virginia City, the, the Comstock. Mr. Sutro said, hey, you're digging on this mountain, what if I dig a tunnel under the, at the side and go in five miles? And, you can just drop everything down and we can drain it and won't be any problem. Mr. Cohenhoven and Mr. Brown came up with the same idea. Let's build a tunnel underneath the, the corner of the smuggler mine. Smuggler didn't need them. Um, the Della S, the Bushwhacker, the Park Regent, and on. And we'll go under Hunter Valley and come out at Woody Creek. Mm -hmm. And we'll build a railroad to Woody Creek. We won't have to pay all the extra freight here. We'll just take it out that way. And the water that's in Smuggler Mountain will drain it out the Cohenhoven Tunnel. Uh, they even got crazy after they started the project. Then they said, oh, well, let's build a freight road from Woody Creek over the top over to the frying pan, and we'll just uh, freight it from there over to the railroad. And then they said, oh, no, why don't we just build a tunnel? <laughs> um, the tunnel eventually became probably two and a half miles long. Uh, but Mr. Brunton was in charge of it which meant that every day he had to lug all of his transit equipment, survey equipment, with him. Uh, took two men to do all of the surveying underground, and he'd have to lug it in. And he said every day he had to walk in more than a mile 
and walk back out. And he got lazy. So he invented the Brunton Velocipede car. <laughs> Is this something to see? Your, your feet set here. You, and this was safe because you were facing what was coming at you and you had time to stop. At least that's the theory. Uh, we do not have one. I'm, I, I wish we had somebody who wanted to build one for us. Because this is what they look like when they were quite popular. Uh, in the quiet years, the school teachers were invited to go on mine tours and explore the mines. Uh, we already have an electric light. Uh, but you can see the pedals here and the velocity. So that's Taylor Brunton's velocity. And are the men standing on the back of the What? The men are standing on the back and the women are No, I, I think they're standing behind. Yeah, they might be standing on the back. Yeah, it looks kind of like they are, uh, but uh, it was easy to pick up. It was lightweight. You could turn it around and go back out. Um, very efficient. Uh, why it didn't kind of catch on, I don't know. Um, they don't trust the electric light. Here's the candle in a tin can for a flashlight. Um, so, and then Mr. Brunton, in 1894, got tired of lugging all of that transit equipment. He had to haul a compass. He had to have a, had to have a compass like this, a small compass. And this compass would fit <coughs> on a tripod. Here we go. This is a cool compass. And he could sight, and then he had another gentleman. And this is just, this is the smallest piece of all of his equipment. And it took two people, because he couldn't, he couldn't look here and look there at the same time, and he had to have it level, and there's no level here, and it was complicated. Mr. Brunton decided, in his infinite wisdom, to come up with something else. He came up with a pocket transit. This has a level in it. It has two levels. One that tells me if I'm level this way. One that tells me um, if I'm level what angle I'm at. There's a device back here that moves. He could figure out by holding this and looking down, there's a mirror in here which reflects. And he could carry this by hand and do preliminary work. Not final work, but preliminary work. He could also use this to sight, and he could figure out the angle of where it was going up or down. This was incredible. He had a, a European company make one for him, and he started to carry it around with him. And everyone that he came across wanted one. <laughs> So he hired Mr. Answorth. Oh, this is a fake. Just so you know. So he hired Mr. Answorth in Denver. Mr. Answorth was a clockmaker and a, and a um, tinkerer. And they came up with the Brunton Compass. And it's not really the Brunton Compass, it's the Brunton Transit. And this is what it is. See, here's this is the mirror here, um, the sight right here is right here, um, and this I don't know a good geologist today who doesn't have a button compass in his pocket. These are not cheap uh, today, they're $900 maybe for a basic, uh, they're very expensive. This became so much in demand. They were producing hundreds of them. Uh, originally, they sold for $50. Uh, they're revolutionary. And I, I have no idea what it does. But I can't even get the compass to release on this one. The thing's broken. So, um, and they're popular. They're great collector's items. People will find, the, you'll find these in some of the cheap antique stores. And uh, the dead giveaway is 
the size and the weight. This weighs eight ounces. Uh, this weighs probably two pounds. So, um, so these are popular. But um, <clears throat> which one's the real one? This one is the real one, the gray one. You want to go for a gray one, okay? <laughs> and this one, this one's pretty old because this one does say uh, Answorth. Um, David Brutton's trademark registered U.S. patent. Um, pocket trans, trans, uh, transit Answorth and Sons. So this one's a this one's a really good one. Um, and generally they're gray. Uh, you'll find some brass ones, but um, the pocket transit. He will add attachments to this. I think there's a, another attachment that he adds. He puts the levels inside and adds pieces to it. So he continues to pack this. The pocket transit becomes so popular that um, it is used quite extensively in World War I. In World War I, the people in the trenches didn't know where they were. But the people who had the pocket transits knew where they were. Uh, and there were many records of how valuable the Brunton Compass was. And that wasn't his only contribute uh, to World War I. He invented a sniper locator. He basically had a tripod and he had a dummy's face sticking up over the, the, the trench. And in the dummy, there was an, uh, some sort of an angle. And when the bullet hit, it measured the angle from where the bullet came, and then they could figure out where the sniper was. Uh, so the guy was a genius, an absolute genius. And uh, so we have some pretty cool inventors if you want to learn how to potato farm or whether you want to go inside the mine and do some surveying. And this is just a, 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 a final photo of Aspen, and you can see the technology here. Here's our electric cars, uh, street cars. Here's all the electric wires we have. Uh, we had telephones. We had telephone service. Uh, we were not connected to the outside world until 1894, uh, when they built, uh, they finally connected us to Leadville. Um, and uh, this is a teaser for next month. Then and now, uh, can you find uh, whatever it is we want to find. So we'll do some, we'll do some, uh, do you know what this is? And do you remember when you came here? When it was? So, uh, this is taken out of the window of the Jerome Hotel. It's looking north on Mill Street, or south on Mill Street. That's the back of the house. Um, and so on. So, um, I, I, I just thought of it. Um, remember the hydropower plant that I was talking about? Mm -hmm. If you want to see that light that was on the very first, that street light, mm -hmm. there is a perfect example of that light in Georgetown. Hmm. Oh, if you go to Georgetown mm -hmm. and you go past the, the famous hotel the, the Frenchman had, mm -hmm. if you go past that up to the mountain, mm -hmm. the last street, right there on the corner, is a hydropower right. plant mm -hmm. still operated by Holy Cross. And XL. XL, XL, yeah, it's XL. Because um, we've, we've been privileged enough not only to walk into their museum, but, but to actually they were repairing one of the, the uh, Pelton wheels. And so we got to look at the dynamos and everything. But that has been in operation since about 1914. And uh, it is still operating today. But in there, on display, they have one of these gigantic electric lights. It's absolutely, I mean, it's huge. It's this big. It's that big around. It's a, it's a huge thing. And uh, it also still has an Aspen connection, uh, more or less. It has a more important Valley connection. Um, in 1914, the Shoshone power plant was constructed. Uh, on the Colorado, you go past it when you go to Denver in Glenwood Canyon. Uh, the power line for that, that was not for Glenwood, that was actually for uh, the East Slope. Uh, the power line came up the Boring Fork, went, followed the Midland line over Hagerman Pass, and then went all the way to Georgetown and connected with Georgetown. And those lines still exist today. Yeah, uh, so that's uh, kind of an interesting sideline as well. 
So I just kind of bounced around, but there's all kinds of technology. But Aspen was really on the cutting edge, especially in mining technology. First to electric hoist, uh, one of the most successful with diamond drill, core drilling. Uh, we were willing to try to electrify the lights inside. Eventually, the mines were electrified. The smuggler mine converted to 100% electricity. Eventually, Mr. Hyman and Mr. D.R.C. Brown. Mr. Hyman owned the smuggler and D.R.C. Brown owned the electric company. And Mr. Hyman figured out, how are we going to save money? Well, if, if I use electricity and it costs this much, I'm going to cut my overall cost. And Mr. D.R.C. Brown said, that sounds great. I don't have enough electricity. I've got to get a new dynamo and a new generator and on and on and on. Oh, I guess I'll have to raise the price of electricity. <laughs> the margins. And they fought back and forth for quite some time. Uh, I think there's still a little animosity. <laughs> islands in the grounds. Uh, that's one of those things. Uh, we were talking about firsts. Um, Telluride says they were first with electricity. They were the first to use um, AC electricity over long distances. Our electricity was DC uh, Edison electricity. <clears throat> Theirs was Westinghouse Tesla AC electricity. Um, and it was two and a half miles from the Ophir mine down to the, uh, to the uh, generator. And it didn't happen until 1891. And we had already had a small AC generator in our Hunter Creek power plant. The AC generator was used for the incandescent lights and the uh, rest was used for the arc lighting. So uh, we even had it, but we didn't transfer to the lights. So that's, that's tell you right. So they work. They get for them, they were first in something. Um, Do you want to tell the story about the Japanese business? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, there's so much information I've got. I know, right? Things. Yeah, good thing. Uh, in, 18, in early 1888, two gentlemen from Kyoto, Japan, electric engineers, came to the United States to investigate the possibility of hydropower. And they, uh, Kyoto was an a, a industrial area, and they had water available. They were building a canal. Uh, through a mountain, and they thought hydropower might be useful. They went to a famous place in New York where they had some hydropower, and it would not apply. While they were there, they heard about this little mining camp out in the far west, uh, Aspen, Colorado, and they came. And they met with Mr. Devereaux, who was the man in charge of the power plant at that time, and Mr. Devereaux said, had they arrived three months earlier, it wouldn't have worked. Because mm -hmm. the system wasn't up and running very well. But they arrived, they took all kinds of notes, uh, drew drawings, etc. They went back to Kyoto and they built a power plant. And it's almost uh, identical to the um, power plant that we have at Hunter Creek, or we had at Hunter Creek. Mm -hmm. Their power plant building is still standing. Mm -hmm. And it's still operating. Um, today. And uh, the gentleman came back in 19... The gentleman's son came back when I believe Bill Sterling was still mayor. Hmm. And he came back and did a presentation and it was a letter from his father about how wonderful the trip was and how well treated he was in Aspen and how Mr. Devereaux helped him. And, and that revolutionized electricity in, in Japan as well. So I had forgotten about that. So, yeah, we just have too much information. <laughs> everything out there. Uh, but uh, pretty, pretty cool deal. So uh, we do get uh, Japanese visitors to come when they want to see the, the old power plant. We have a, a building still, but that's all. We shut off power. We had hydropower here until um, I believe it was 1956, um, Holy Cross came in and convinced the city that it was cheaper to use Rural Electric Association electricity. 
we hooked up to the grid. The power plant stayed uh, available until 1958 when it was decommissioned. And then in 1960, we had a massive blizzard and all of the Holy Cross electricity went down. And they fired up the Castle Creek and Aspen had power um, during the blizzard. <laughs> Nobody else did. And then after that, it was um, shut down and all of that was salvaged. So, uh, and the big power plant is down at the bottom of uh, um, Power Plant Power Road, plant road. <laughs> uh, and that's where the power plant was located, the big power plant. As I said, it gets very confusing in the early years because we had basically three companies that were trying at the same time, and one disappeared, they, all, they sort of formed and they disappeared. And the, the city granted one company the right to electric lights, and then the next city council meeting, they took that right away from them and gave it to the other guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the one thing has changed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it got very complicated. But as I said, the very first power plant was actually a test dyno at the mill uh, down on the Rio Grande property about where the uh, uh, recycle center and the, and the skateboard park are. Mm -hmm. There was a mill down there, a concentrating mm -hmm. mill, which eventually uh, belonged to the smuggler. But um, they tested down there and got things working, and then they put together the power plant out on Castle Creek, and then they replaced it uh, later as well. Actually, it came online in 1893, right when the crash of Silver came. So it was a little, little late to the party. But that's a little bit about technology. Uh, we're just as sophisticated today as we were back then. <laughs> and I'll see you all in a, in a month. We'll do, we'll do that and now. I remember when it was. <laughs> do you, we have time for Isn't, some question and answer? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm here for questions. Usually these, yeah. I kind of stayed on topic today. <laughs> <laughs> we have about 15 minutes because yeah. we do have to set up for a board meeting. Yeah, the other, the other night you guys... I was yeah, somewhere else the other night, and somebody asked a question, and we just went off. <laughs> but yeah, you had a question. Yeah, does anything remain of the Kalahogan Tunnel Works? Yes, yes. and no. <laughs> um, not anything that you can access. The tunnel is still there. Um, there is some water coming out of it. Um, I believe there's a small Vic pipe. It's what is it, about five inches? Yeah. Um, a bit small. Yeah, it's pretty small. There's some water still coming out of it. Where does um, it come out? Hmm? Where does it come out? Uh, over by Spruce Street, at the end of Spruce Street. Huh. Um, and, then, and then there's water coming out from the mines all over. Uh, you know, the water that goes across uh, Gibson Avenue uh, is coming out of the valley, I think. Um, the water in, uh, in the fountain is coming out of um, the lower Durant, and uh, some of your drinking water is coming out of the uh, Aspen Mountain uh, uh, Springs. So, um, yeah, uh, but uh, it's been covered over and long gone. When they started to do Williams Woods and all of that, they, they started to cover that. Up. How about the free silver shaft? The free silver shaft. Got a bunch of cotton. Yeah, we, we're pretty sure we know where it is because when we go up to the smuggler, if you've gone to the smuggler mine and you go in the gate and then to get up to the to the mine tour, uh, you have to go all the way around the left and go up. And as you make that turn, there's a whole lot of cottonwoods. Cottonwoods require their roots to be in water. Hence, we don't have a lot of new cottonwoods anymore. Thank we God. Have yeah. uh, but cottonwoods roots have to be in water. And so because we've got such large cottonwoods on that little corner of the smuggler, uh, we're pretty sure it was supposedly about 300 feet from the number one. And that's about dead on, 100 yards. Huh. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty sure we know what it's And it went straight It went down. vertical. There were two shafts. Six feet by eight feet, and it went vertical for eighteen hundred feet from there. Eighteen hundred feet. When the city parks water two-inch line broke a couple of years ago, 
and I thought it was going to wash the hill up. Yeah. It ran over that area and hit the cottonwoods. And I'm going. Yeah, it's going. It's yeah. going somewhere. It's going somewhere. Wow. And it wasn't That's going on the street. So, you know, the cool thing to what Larry and I get to do is we get to go inside and look around. <laughs> we'll, we'll take you in, but not when we do. We had we had fun last uh, November. We had uh, what was it? Six mine rescue teams from around the country. Uh, yeah, you folks probably don't notice what's going on at the summer, but um, rescue teams from around the country come and train in the summer because the, it's so unusual. It's uh, it's very complicated in there. There are lots of scenarios you can do, and uh, like the school of mines, they have their own mine. But those students have memorized every rock and mm. frame. So you bring them up here and you say, go rescue Joe, go find him. Oh, we turn off the lights and fill it with smoke. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> we have a sense of humor. I know. Um, but yeah, it, it's quite interesting. Hmm. The, the Enterprise, uh, or um, the uh, Free Silver, uh, to, to take the chance to be 100% electric, that's a pretty big leap in technology. Uh, they didn't even have steam to actually for that. The smugglers did. Now, when the, when, the, uh, when it was flooded, when the smuggler was flooded, the molly and all of the mines were flooded and they decided to dewater, um, they used the uh, free silver. And when they went down with the deep sea divers, it was the free silver shaft. It was the smuggler mine they were draining, but it was the free was silver down, shaft. Free shaft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was the smuggler, the Molly, and the Della S got together to do it? Yeah, which is like a leap of faith, too, when you consider the Molly and the, and the smuggler didn't actually go along very well. The Molly is an interesting mine, also. The Molly, Molly is probably the most famous by publication and by reputation. But the facts are the Molly didn't produce very much at all. It was all public relations and stock raising. J.J. Um, had, uh, had a knack for uh, keeping things. There's a secret in the Molly. And they've just found a great big vein. I've got to go buy some stock. And the stock would raise. And nobody would hear a And a month later, oh man, you should see what they found in the Molly. Mm -hmm. and, or there would be a press release. Mm -hmm. So, so it was it was as much a promotion as it was. Although they did find one one uh, <coughs> pocket of incredibly rich ore, very rich ore. Is which, the Molly the Molly Gibson? Mm -hmm. The Molly, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, we we. Yeah, we forget or the, the comp is the compromise, and the Molly's the Molly Gibson, and the smug is the smuggler, and yeah, and the AJ is the Argent, Argentum Juniata. Yeah, yeah. Um, we need, uh, yeah. We just, we just call him the AJ. How would you yeah. say it? Yeah. Juniata. Was the Molly up to hmm? Was the Molly up Ajax? No, the Molly was right next to the smuggler. When you, okay. do you do you know where you park your cars? Yeah. To, to go walk up the smuggler? The top uh, lot. Yeah, the top lot, not down on the, on the paved yeah. street. Yeah. On the, on, as, as you make that first turn, and there's kind of a little yeah. kiosk right there, uh, just off a few feet from there is where the Molly shaft was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Molly was. Yeah, they were, next, they were next door to you. You caught some guy the other day. Yeah. What was he doing? Cross mascot. Uh, Taking the woods. Uh, <laughs> you don't need that on camera. Two more questions. Yeah, any, anything else? Like anything on one? All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we've had the pleasure of touring uh, Smuggler. Mm -hmm. with Jay, are there other mines available for tour? Not at. Oh, there are 16 mines in Colorado. I mean, here. Here. Not current. The compromise did and could again, but it's complicated. <laughs> like and, and, I'll, and I'll just leave it at that. It's very complicated. If you were privileged enough to go into the compromise, it is a totally different experience than the smoke. It's like night and day. 
Because when you go in the compromise, you go in by rail, and when you get to the stope, in the, in the smuggler, they will show you a small stope, the Gary stope, which is about the size of this room, 200 feet down. Um, the one in the compromise, you can't see the bottom. It's about 900 feet down, and it's about 200 feet across. I've been in there and I've seen clouds form. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. It's a very different, and even the geology over there is significantly different than you find in the mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very different experience. And no, it's not available. I wish it was. And when it does, I will be doing tours. <laughs> I'm sure Jay, will, Jay and I will be more than happy to take you in. Yeah. Will that be publicized again? Oh, yeah, it would be, but I, I don't see it happening anytime soon. It's just, like I said, it's, it's become very complicated. Well, why not just say we've got safety issues? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We have some tired wood in there. Yeah. Oh, they can take you in there, but they'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, it's it's pretty cool. There, there's water running in there. And there are lots of water coming down. Uh, you can see uh, new minerals forming. And, uh, it's it's just a bit. And they don't have an oxygen problem. <laughs> you can go back way back in there. There's a breeze coming out of there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's and don't cool. sneak in while we're closing <coughs> it down. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. If you're lucky and you 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 miss the miners, somehow if you miss the miners coming out and you go in and they lock the gate, oh, boy. you better hope your cell phone works oh. at the gate of the portal. Well, yeah. bottom line is don't sneak in. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Go, yeah. don't go in any abandoned line. For a stone like the one in the compromise uh -huh. where it drops down 900 yeah. feet, did they bring the ore out the bottom? Eventually they did, down on the, uh, uh, what's the Aspen Drainage and Mining Company next to the uh, Enterprise and the Veteran. Um, remember where the water tank used to be on the little mill? Right there, if you if you look where the water tank used to be, if you go into those bushes, there's a a wall made out of solid stone, and there's the shaft for the I think that was the homestake claim originally. There's a shaft there, and they had two coreless engines that uh, that ran and dropped people down. They brought stuff out on the lower side. That was the the train actually went up to that level. There was a there was a Y out at the end of Ute Avenue, and that, that little trail that goes across um, the mountain there comes out at about Tower Number Four, and that came across and around just the base of Aspen Mountain, uh, so they could take the more cars up there. Can you see in that picture? Um, no, it's kind of the west side. No, it goes off over here, the incline. Um, but it came right over to here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, here we go, here we go. Um, that's, that's the veteran, the enterprise, and here, here it is, there it is, right there. Uh, if you go up there in the summer, right here, there's still, in the, in the weeds, there's still a great big wood platform uh, that's up there. That's the original ski jump <laughs> that they had in Aspen. We had a ski jump right there. And that's the original ski jump. And it's right right in right about here in the in the woods. And it's still there. It's huge. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Friedel and all those guys. Are, are those mine tailings still down there? Those are not mine tailings, okay? I'm, I'm gonna get Oh okay. <laughs> uh, I'll be here. Okay. A mine tailing is the bad stuff that's left over when you process the ore in a smelter. Leadville has tailings. Bad stuff. This is the dump. What they've done is the rock that's no good, doesn't have any ore in it, doesn't have any 
of the bad stuff. It's just the junk rock that you have to dig out to get to where you want to go. So it's a dump. Yeah, we, we get really. Yeah, we get real picky because uh, as soon as someone says it's a tailings, they go, "Oh my God, call the EPA." We're on the side. Um, and, and, and that doesn't happen. So is the dump still up? Yeah, uh, some of them are. Mm -hmm. Some of them are. A lot have been removed. A lot of just removed away. Yeah, uh, up at the comp, comps right in, in about here. Um, Still we're on that. Mm -mm. Yeah, there's a it's whole. The smoke, isn't it? Oh yeah, no, I'm right over there. Um, behind the smoke. Um, yeah, there's a lot of dump. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, uh, what's left over from a concentrating mill is that a dump or a tailing? That could be a tailing. Fortunately, our concentrators washed it all down the river. <laughs> <laughs> it's not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go to Lake Powell? <laughs> All right, we need to wrap it up, unfortunately, because yeah. we could yeah. be here all day. Larry, thank you.